for those in the back. Uh, a couple of things coming up. Uh, we have our, after this morning's service, we have uh, First Sunday uh, Fellowship Meal. So if you uh, will, please stay for that. Uh, we've got plenty of food, so uh, please plan to stay for that. Afterwards, there'll be a, a song service and devotion after the meal uh, upstairs uh, in the auditorium. Uh, third Saturday will be the men's meeting coming up. And then January 21st, 22nd at 9.30 in Goldsboro, uh, they're having a grief seminar. So if you're able to attend that or if you need to attend that or, or want to, uh, we've got uh, some information in the back. Uh, one other thing will be uh, today, after the service is all over, if you're available and can help uh, move Michelle, she's moving today. Uh, so there's, <clears throat> I understand there's whole, not a whole lot of items, but uh, do need some help moving if you're available. And uh, see Becky or Michelle. Uh, a few other things will be uh, back Wednesday, if you're able to, for the Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. And then uh, Thursday morning, the adult classes have been canceled for a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll announce when they start back. And... Uh, Sherry, on prayer request, we found out this morning Sherry uh, has pneumonia, so keep her in your prayers. Um, Sandra McMillan, she's having some uh, stents put in coming up soon, uh, so be with her and be, be also with Jackie. He was having some blood pressure issues yesterday. A uh, <clears throat> friend of Gary's, uh, Larry Young, used to be his neighbor. Uh, he, he, I think he's in hospice or he's sent home from hospice. Anyway, he's not doing well. And then Yolanda's father, uh, Freddie, was baptized last Sunday. Uh, and again, he's not doing well as, uh, with the uh, cancer. Uh, his cancer is terminal. So be with him, his, uh, his wife, and be with Yolanda and her family as they're uh, still visiting him. Uh, I think that's it from the announcements. Uh, if you will, let's go to God in prayer. You know, God, what a, a glorious day you've given us, and uh, <clears throat> Lord, for the first day of the week, for us to come together and, and uh, study your word and worship you. Lord, we're uh, excited for the first day of the new year, and Lord, we pray that uh, that this is what we do during the new year, is, is keep, you, keep you focused in our minds and hearts, and study your word, and, and uh, learn more to be like you. And uh, Lord, we <clears throat> have several on the prayer list this morning. Uh, we pray for those folks. We pray for the families and the caretakers. And uh, Lord, we've got uh, several folks traveling this morning. We pray for those. Uh, Lord, as we begin our worship service, I uh, pray for Brian as he delivers a message. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, everything we do is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one. <clears throat> to God be the glory, praise be the
429. 429. 429. This will be the song we sing before the Lord's Supper. 598.
And does everyone have a, if you don't, if you'd raise your hand, we'll get you one. The drink? Okay. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine up in the mountains this week, and he uh, said that his wife was getting ready to go to worship last Sunday and said one of her friends called her and said, well, you're not going today, are you? It's Christmas. And she said, well, why don't you kick the MAS off of the end of that and see what you got? Why would you not go today? <laughs> and that is what in Acts 20th chapter, verse 7, we're commanded the first day of every week, whether it's Christmas or whether it's New Year's today, whatever the day falls on, if it's the first day of the week, we're to be here if we can get here to break bread as a congregation, as a group of Christians. And as we do that, we're doing as God has told us to do. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you to thank you so much for what your son went through for us. As, as we know, we're not worthy of what he price he paid, but he thought we was. And Father, we can't ever imagine the pain and the suffering this man went through for us. And Father, we pray as we break this bread and take it that we would examine ourselves, that we would try to be the best person that we can be to ourselves and to others. We pray, Father, that as we examine ourselves, we find ourselves worthy of this bread. We pray now that you be with us as we partake together as a family of Christians. In Christ's name, amen. And it will continue for the, for the juice. Would you bow with me again, please? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again to thank you so much, Father, for what this juice represents, your Son's blood, which dripped down off of that tree that day, Father, that we may all have the continuous blood of Christ, that, that it would, we would be so gracious as to thank you each and every day, not just on the first day of the week, that we come to you on the first day of the week to thank you for your son, for the price he paid, that each one of us would have the opportunity someday to be with you in heaven if we only do what is asked of us. And Father, we pray now that we partake of this in a manner pleasing to thee. In Christ's name, amen. And this concludes the Lord's Supper, and we found this to be the most convenient time to offer thanks for our givings. And if you would, would you bow with me as we give thanks for the giving to the congregation, to the church. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you, and Father, we thank you so much for the time that you give us on this earth, the opportunity we have to earn a living and to supply the needs that we have for ourselves and for others. But Father, we pray as we do that, we also examine the needs of, of each congregation and, Father, the need to put your word into this world. And the only way we can do that is to give back a portion of what we have and to give it with a cheerful heart, to give it with the attitude that we want and need this money to go to help further your word through this world. And we pray, Father, that as we use these monies, we would use them in that manner. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning will be from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Uh, Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.
Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to be back together, assembled this morning to spend this time in worship. Um, let me. For some reason that's not turning on. I guess I'll have to guess at where y'all are. But uh, but happy New Year to you guys and. And uh, it's kind of an amazing thing to see 2023. Uh, you know, when I was a teenager in, in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, and I, I remember wishing at times to be older and, and thinking about, you know, 2000 as being some far off time period. I didn't know if I'd ever live to see, you know, it's so far away. And now we're at 2023. And uh, it's kind of an amazing uh, how quickly time grows faster as you get older. The weeks uh, tumble by, uh, and, and, and as we now have turned the page, I, I will try to, uh, although I don't write the dates very often anymore, remember I having to write out checks and remember the right, the right date, and every year it was a struggle for the month of January to remember to put the next year on your check or whatever form you're filling out, but uh, uh, but this year we'll, we'll we'll do that again with 23 and remember to do that and and I just think about how quickly time changes and how quickly it seems to ebb by. As the new year brings us, it brings us new hopes, new challenges, new opportunities. I think it's important to focus on those kind of things and, and thinking about what God is going to lay out before us. I, I want to again say thank you so much to the men who were able to be here yesterday. We, we spent the morning in prayer. Uh, it was such an uplifting time for me uh, to, heal, to hear sorry, my fellow uh, servants here to hear you pray and to open up your heart before God. Thank you so much for, for doing that and, and, and to keep this congregation uh, on your mind and heart and, and focusing on uh, what God may have in store for us this year. Um, I was, I, I like to watch animal documentaries and things. Uh, I've recently discovered Netflix has a lot more of those than I would have ever imagined. And you know now if you get on, if you have a next Netflix account, when you open the page up, there are all these suggestions. And so I spend my time uh, sometimes more enamored with the suggestions and just going through them trying to decide what I'm going to watch next. And sometimes I waste away what time I had. But I was watching one recently and they, had, uh, uh, they were showing this rabbit that was out in the field and some wild dogs had come and they thought they were going to eat dinner. And so they, they chose one of those little furry things and began to chase it. And I sat there and watched in amazement as that rabbit zigzagged back and forth through this field, this open field, watching. And, and, and you'd see those dogs get, get just close enough and they'd sweep across the back of the leg. The dog would face plant and the rabbit would run off in another direction. The other dog would come up behind it. And it was just back and forth, back and forth. You know, I was sitting there thinking about, you know, when your life is on the line, you, you, you find that determination that sometimes we don't have in life. When, when you become so singularly focused on one objective, which that rabbit had one objective, I got to get away from these two or, or that's it for me. And so he, he had every incentive in the world to get away. You know, I, you think about this idea of, of, of focus, of attention, of resolution. And from, the, from a biblical standpoint, you know, this is an idea that continues to, to come out over and over again. I, I think about Daniel, uh, Daniel 1 and verse 8. You remember... Daniel, this young Jewish man who, who had been taken into Babylonian captivity, 
Uh, his name has been changed. His world has been tossed upside down. And he's been actually, because of, of, of his character and, and, and different things, has, the king of, of Babylon has decided that he, among many others, are going to be brought into the king's court. And they're, they're going to eat from the king's table. And in doing so, these young men would be challenged to violate the law of Moses. Now, as we know from Daniel, as, as from his character and who he was, he, he was not a man who wanted to violate God's word. And so, as this comes up, he is going to present an alternative plan to the chief eunuch of the king's court. And in doing so, I want you to know what it says in verse 8. I'm not going to focus on Daniel this morning, but I do want to focus on verse 8. The text there says in the English Standard that Daniel had resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. Um, other translations ha have, the, have that phrase or that term translated he purposed in his mind, or the idea that, that, that he had already made up his mind before this event ever occurred, before he was ever faced with this temptation to violate the customs of the Mosaic law, that he would not do that, that he would not violate God's truth. I like that idea of being resolved. In, in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, in a discussion here of, of giving and, and how that you and I should give with a cheerful heart, we shouldn't give out of obligation, but we should give because of how God's blessed us. I want you to note how Paul says that we should determine our giving. It's not by percentage, but it is by an attitude. He says here that each one, each Christian, must give as he has decided in his heart, as he has resolved himself to do. You may sit down at the beginning of a new year and plan a budget for the year. Some of us will do that. We'll sit down and we'll look at all of our bills. We'll look at all of our obligations. And in doing that, we'll, we'll consider what we're going to give to the church and to the kingdom of God. And, and we'll determine whatever that number is. But we're making a resolution. We are resolving ourselves to do this. And with that in mind, we go to Hebrews chapter 12 and the passage that Patrick read for us there. And the Hebrews writer has just written a whole passage on faith and, and on its significance and what it is. You know, Hebrews 11 verse 1, now faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6, for it is impossible to please God without faith. Because we must believe that He is and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And he goes on to, to lay out example after example of individuals who had faith, who had resolved themselves to follow God even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. And so in 12 verse 1, he, he turns the, the focus, the attention of his writing off of those individuals and turns it on to us, or initially it was on the Hebrew Christians. And so he says to them, therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily cling or which so uh, which clings so closely, and let us run, let us run with endurance. Another way to translate that is let us run with long suffering, or let us run with patience. Focusing our attention, looking unto Jesus, resolving ourselves to follow in His footsteps. 
resolving ourselves. You know, I think about Jesus, and, and as he goes on there to explain in verse 2 why we should look to Jesus, because he is the author or founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We should resolve ourselves. We should purpose in our minds, determine within ourselves to seek after him. And in doing that, and in discussing this, the Hebrews writer brings up Jesus on example of determination. I want you to note a couple passages in this line of thinking. In Luke 9, Luke 9, I want you to know what What's going on here? Luke 9, uh, we, we find Luke's recording of the transfiguration. You'll also find this in Matthew 17. This is where the apostles are with Jesus, and after Peter makes his confession of faith, right after that, Jesus is transfigured on the mountain where he, he, he begins to shine forth, if you will, and there beside of him, they see Moses and Elijah. Now that's the context that this is with, within. Now, chapter 9 and verse 30, the text tells us that, Behold, two men were talking with him, talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Moses because he represents the law of Moses, and Elijah because he represents the prophets are there with Jesus. But what are they doing with him? Verse 31, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Of course, when it says departure, it's talking about the way he would die. Now, we have spent sermons and classes discussing all the elements of that and all the difficulty of the circumstance of the way Jesus was crucified and, and how terrifying that truly was. And so here are Moses and Elijah and they are discussing with him what he's going to go through. Doesn't, you, doesn't that beg to, in our minds a question? Why? Why? What could they be saying to him in that regard? What is it that they're trying to discuss with him? Are they possibly trying to encourage him? Are they possibly trying to comfort him? It could be a myriad of reasons, but I do find it very fascinating. If you go on later... Uh, or sorry, if you go to the book of Matthew, again, in that same general context, Matthew 16, am I on target? I am. Matthew 16, again, this is just after uh, Peter made his confession of faith and Jesus then discusses the establishment of the church. It says in verse 21 that right after that, what did he begin to do? He began to show his disciples, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And later on he'll say, and to be killed. Did Jesus understand where he was going? Yes, he was fully aware of it. He knew exactly what waited for him at the end of that journey. Now there are some times in my life when I'm walking along or I'm driving or I'm going somewhere and I don't know the destination or I don't know what might occur at the end of the destination. I may anticipate certain things going on, but to know with a surety is different. To know exactly what you're going to find. I imagine as a uh, police officer, Tori and, and, and her uh, co-workers often will go to homes and They've, they've ran a call and they know what the call may say domestic dispute or may say something else, may say welfare check. But, but going there, you don't know what you're going to walk into. It could just be a husband and wife having a little tiff and you go in and break it up and, 
And so, but it could be much worse. I remember there was a, a man that I used to worship with in Tennessee who was a police officer, and he would tell stories. And one of the stories he told was he was going to do a welfare check on someone, and when he got into the home, he was confronted with a gun in his face. Well, that's a different situation. Things have escalated quickly. And he went on to tell us how he talked that person down. And I just sat there in amazement listening to it. I mean, what a situation to walk into. There are times in our lives when we walk into a situation and if we had known what we were walking into, we may not have went. You ever, you have those stories in your mind? You're like, if I could go and do that over, I wouldn't. Well, here's Jesus. He knows exactly what he's walking into, and it's terrifying. There's not a human being alive who could face that situation without terror and horror in their mind. And so he begins to discuss that with them. And then you have an interesting interaction. You have Peter jump up and say, Far be it from you, Lord, these things are not going to happen. I'm kind of paraphrasing there a little bit. But basically, Jesus, uh, Peter is rebuking Jesus for even talking in this way. We ever do that with people who, talk, who, who are trying to speak a reality to us? We don't want to hear it? Like, you stop talking like that. I don't want to hear that from you. We don't want to hear those negative things. Peter did not want to hear this. Because this is not pleasant. What's Jesus' response? He says, in a very kind of strong way, he says, get behind me, Satan. He's calling Peter Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God. You have not, you're not setting your mind You're not determined. You're not living with the same determination, the same resolution as I am. Back in Luke 9.51. Am I up there? Again, in the same context. Now note, remember what's going on. You just had Moses and Elijah discussing with Jesus what's going to occur. He's begun to tell his disciples what's going to happen. And he knows exactly what he's going to face. Verse 51 tells us, when the, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, what did he do? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. How hard was that? How many times did he sit there and wonder, is there another way? There's got to be some other way to do this. I don't want to have to go through this. I don't want to feel that pain. I don't want to go through that mental anguish. There has to be. We know he thought about that, don't we? What was the prayer he prayed three times in the garden? If this cup can pass from me. Please do it. But not your will, not my will, thine be done. He set his determination, his focus toward Jerusalem. Into verse 53. He set his face to that destination. He was resolved. That's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? That's the message of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. That's the same kind of resolve, the same kind of determination that you and I need in our own lives to set ourselves, to determine within our hearts, I will not defile myself in that way. I will determine myself to live up to His pattern of faith and practice. In 2023, I want to share with you some resolutions that as children of God, we should each take on. Now, some of us yesterday, maybe the weeks prior, have been thinking about 
possible resolution. Some of us may have made resolutions at this point. I think the younger you are, the more resolutions you have. The older you get, the more you remember how many you failed on and you quit making them, as, at least as many. But some of us have resolutions in our mind. Some of us are resolved to lose weight. Some of us are resolved to exercise more. Some of us are resolved to learn, to grow. Whatever it is, you have resolutions in your life. There are things you're resolved to do. Let me give you some spiritual things that I think that all Christians should be resolved to do. Number one, each of us should be resolved within ourselves to be a more faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Luke 9 again. Again, in that same context, there's so much richness in this whole context that we could just continue to pull out. But in the midst of all of that discussion, Jesus didn't forget about us. Even in the midst of all that was going on around him, he still had a focus on you and me. Notice what he says. Luke 23, if anyone would come after me, that's you and me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That's that focus and determination. Let me set my face in this direction. Let me determine within myself. I will resolve myself to follow Jesus. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever would... Uh, Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Will we lose ourselves in Christ in 2023? Can I determine, resolve myself to become a more faithful follower? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. The Hebrews writer says to us, let us hold fast. Let us, what? Determine within ourselves. Let us hold fast. Let us cling so closely let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. There's that determination. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, and a little pre-planning here, isn't there? There's purpose in us. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, Let, not neglecting to meet together. That's what those who are undetermined, unfocused, unresolved do. They, they miss church. They don't come to Bible class. They don't lead. They don't follow. They're those who neglect their faith. We're not of that. We are resolved, what? As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's resolve ourselves to be a more faithful follower. Number two, may we resolve ourselves to be a more forgiving follower, to be more forgiving, to let go of any kind of hatred or anger, any of those things which rot the soul. Those are all cancers of the soul. All those things damage us. They tear away at us. They also tear away at our salvation. Again, a passage that we looked at Wednesday night, but in our devotional time. But there again, Matthew six fourteen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Notice this. But... If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Again, you notice the, the contingent nature on that. I cannot, as a Christian, I cannot hold on to hatred of individuals. I cannot do that and call myself a child of God. I have to let go of those things and I have to practice Forgiveness. I have to determine within myself that even when it's hard, I'm not going to hate. I'm not going to hold on to anger and to rage, to bitterness. In Matthew 18, 
Jesus gives to us a, a parable in this line of thinking. Peter, in verse 21, asked that question, Lord, how, how, um, how, how often uh, will my brother sin against me and, and, and I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus says in response, well, I don't say to you just forgive him seven times, but seven times 70 in a day. In other words, we need to be people who practice forgiveness. And then he relates this parable. And he, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can go back and read there in verse 22 and following, where he talks about uh, an individual who had been in great debt. This, this man owed just a tremendously huge debt to, to his master. And it was one he could not pay. It was one that, that, that actually he needed to be punished for and would have to suffer. He goes to the master and he knows his situation is dire. And he gets down and he begins to beg for forgiveness. You ever beg for forgiveness for something? Doesn't your begging correlate exactly to the amount of damage you've done? Often it does, right? The more way. And I can imagine this man just pleading, like just laying out all of his emotion before this man, and it moves him. And he does something amazing. He doesn't set up a repayment plan with him. You know, sometimes if we owe debts, we can go and talk to our credit card company or our different lender and we can say I can't pay it right now and some of them will set up a replacement plan with us because they want our money ultimately but that's not what this guy does he just simply says it's all forgiven don't worry about it don't don't pay me what an amazing gift now Really, the parable is about the reaction to that. That's all to set up the rest of it. It's really about the end. Now, this man has been forgiven this tremendous debt. And what does he do? Well, Joe, who I work with, I'm paraphrasing here, but Joe owes me a lot of money. Well, nothing like I owed, but... But I need that. You know, now I've been forgiven all this debt. Now I can really get my finances in order. I can start working on my own bank account. You know, I, I feel that weight gone. And this man who has been forgiven of more than just a debt, but a prison sentence, goes and finds that guy and grabs him by the neck and begins to choke him. I want my money. I want my money. I even go so far as to throw him into prison for, in comparison, a meager amount. Eventually, what we find out is the master finds out and that man is punished because he, as, as it says in verse 32, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? What a great gift mercy is. What a great gift mercy is. Anybody who's received it, and if you're a Christian, you have. Anybody who's received mercy understands that, man, what a powerful gift. What, what an awe-inspiring gift that is. We as Christians should be those of, who are the most merciful. Can I resolve myself in 2023 to be a more merciful person, to be a more forgiving servant of God, to forgive even when it's really difficult? Number three, if I want to be the kind of Christian I need to be. I need to resolve myself to be a better Bible student. Better Bible student. We can all grow in this area, can't we? 
Can I become a more dedicated student of the Word of God? 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous? There's that determination, isn't it? Zealous for good uh, for what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them. Again, that idea of resolve, determination. Nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord. Notice, in your heart, in your mind. Again, that resolve. That's the battleground Satan plays on, isn't it? Your mind. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in us. Now there's one stipulation there, one thing it's not said in the text directly, but I can imply. That person who asks the hope that is in you needs to see the hope living in you. Nobody's going to ask whether uh, about my faith in Christ if they don't see faith in my life. I just want to note that. But he goes on to say, when people ask for the hope that is in you, I need to be able to give a defense, a reason for that lie. The real penetrating question, am I prepared to do that? Can I give a reasonable defense for the hope that is in me? In Paul's writing to Timothy, in his second letter to Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, he says to Timothy, study, or as some translations have it, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who, who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, or rightly dividing the word of truth. Am I a good Bible student? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Are you a good Bible student? That does not mean that I know everything that Scripture has to say. It doesn't mean I understand every in and out of all of Scripture. Am I a good student means that when I know I lack somewhere in understanding, I am actively seeking out understanding. That may take a while sometimes. But asking, am I a good Bible student, is an important question and one that we all need to ask. Can I be a better Bible student in 2023? Absolutely. Will we resolve ourselves to do that even this very day? And finally, in 2023, let's resolve ourselves to be a more proactive evangelist. And I put proactive for a purpose. Sometimes we may have the idea that, you know, if somebody ever comes in and they sit down and, and after services, they ever ask me about Jesus, I'm ready. Hey, I'm waiting for that day somebody knocks on my door and says, hey, will you share the gospel with me? Is that being a proactive evangelist? But is that not the way that we far too often handle evangelism? That's not really evangelism. An evangelist is someone who's proactive in sharing their faith with others. John chapter 1 and verse 6 and following, this is written of John the Baptist. And I think it's something that you and I would, be, would do well to implement in our own lives. John, writing about John the Immerser, John the Baptist, he says, there was a man sent from God. Hey, that's you and me. Did you know that? You were sent from God to teach the gospel. That's why in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, go, therefore, and teach. Go. That's you and me. We were sent from God. There was a man sent from God, like us, John, whose name was John, he came as a witness to bear witness, that's our job, to bear witness, about the light, that all 
might believe through Him. He was not the light. We're not the light. But we came to bear witness about the light. There's a powerful example of this in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. After the killing, the murder of Stephen, the Christian, the church suffers under heavy persecution. That, that kind of becomes uh, like the beginning uh, of the great persecution of a man named Saul. We'll later know him as Paul the Christian, but this time he's not a Christian. And in verses, in those first couple of verses, the text tells us he was making havoc of the church. And these Christians are sent out of Jerusalem or, or escape out of Jerusalem in, in absolute fear of persecution. Now, any of us might say, well, you know, you're, it's quite reasonable that you would start to shut up about your Christianity. Look at what's going on. You're being persecuted. That's not what they did. Verse 4 tells us that even those who suffered such heavy persecution were scattered about preaching the word. They went about everywhere preaching the word. Do we find ourselves going about everywhere preaching the word? Could that be said of us even in our own community? Sorry, I didn't mean to go there just yet. Acts chapter 4, I'm sorry, John chapter 4. Jesus has been talking with a Samaritan woman, and we won't go through their discussion, but here's this woman who, who is without hope. This is a woman who was living in sin, and, and one interaction with Jesus completely transforms this woman's life. Not that he took away any of her problems, but he changed her resolution in life. Her resolve and determination had been turned upside down. And so she leaves Jesus and she begins to proclaim Jesus to everyone she meets. And on seeing that, I want you to note Jesus' reaction to that. Verse 31, the text says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Now he's not saying he had a Snickers snatched away in a pocket. I remember watching a movie a few years ago where a husband and wife had moved into the small town and their, all their stuff got wasn't being delivered like it was supposed to. And they didn't have any food, they didn't really have anything, and they're stuck in this house for a couple of days. Well, there was one apple and she saw it. She didn't tell him about it. He found the core the next day. All right, she snuck it away. Jesus isn't holding any loaves of bread in his pockets. That's not what he's talking about, is it? Notice as he goes on, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So what is that? Do not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look. I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white for the harvest. There's so many out there. They're looking for truth. There are those individuals in our own lives, in our own communities, who need to hear the gospel. But here's something that's kind of scary, really challenging, but also very hopeful. You may be their only witness to Christ. That's scary, isn't it? If you don't do what you're supposed to do, they're not going to hear what they need to hear. Because you know what? Jesus sent you into their life. He expects you to do your part. That's scary. And it's going to challenge us to get out of our comfort zone and our the way we normally live and to be uncomfortable that's challenging but it's very hopeful because he sent you 
because he believes in you. God has a lot of faith in you. He spent a lot of resources to educate you, to lift you up, to edify you, to put you into the lives that you live in now. Jesus, God, did all that so that you could do your one simple part to be a better evangelist than you've been in the past. To say that word, to speak those words to that individual that they need to hear. Will you make a difference? That's how we make a difference in our world. It's not by changing politics. It's not by changing culture. It's by changing the life of one person. You change the life of one person, you have changed the world. Will I resolve myself in this new year to become a more faithful follower, to become a more forgiving follower, to come become a better Bible student and a more proactive evangelist? The challenge is set there before us all. And it's especially before us as we see those in a, around us who are not Christians. There are people here this morning who are not Christians. Let me challenge you. Do you want to continue to live that way? Do you want to continue to be outside of Jesus Christ? Oh, it's such a dangerous life to live. There's such hope, such mercy and forgiveness in Christ. We give you an opportunity. God gives you an opportunity to come forward, to make a change in your life, to obey the gospel, to become one of His children, to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sin. This morning, can we help you with that? Maybe you just need to study more. Maybe you don't quite understand. That's okay. That's why we're here. It's a room full of evangelists. And all of them are ready and eager, right, to share the gospel. Any of us would love to tap you or for you to tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, can I learn a little bit more about this Jesus? And each of us would say, yes, absolutely. And where I can't help you, I'm going to get you help. This morning, can we help you? If you need to come forward for any reason, please come together. We stand and sing.
seated and turn with me to number 954. 954. Nine fifty four. Jesus number 391. Turn over to 391. <clears throat> if you would, uh, please, if you feel like it, please stand for this one and then we'll have the closing prayer. 391. What?
three period day we uh, have some folks that have been traveling that are back with us we're glad to have y'all we're certainly always glad to have those that are are visiting with us Yolanda it's good to see you back your stepdad last name Freddie Johnson Freddie Hicks Freddie Hicks we, we were trying to decide earlier Freddie Hicks uh, but we we're excited that, to hear that he was baptized last Sunday. Glad you're safely back with us, you and the family. Uh, we will be having lunch downstairs, so uh, if you, uh, I hope everybody will, will join us. Uh, I know we'll have some good food and and uh, enjoy some fun and fellowship with one another. We did have a good day yesterday with our prayer breakfast. Thank Lisa for fixing us such a, a good breakfast. And then for all the men uh, who, who were here, uh, you know, it was, it was just very nice. I will close us in prayer. At, uh, after uh, lunch, we'll come back and we'll have our, our singing and then a, a devotional. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you again for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to come worship you this morning. Father, we thank you for the uh, blessings of life we enjoy. We uh, thank you for the pretty sunshine, for the good health that allows us to be here today, for uh, you know our uh, houses, for our, our clothes that we have to wear, for the food that we have to eat. We know all this comes to us through you. Father, uh, we continue to pray for uh, the uh, McMillans, uh, Sandry and, and Jackie. Pray for uh, <coughs> Billy Voss and Gary and Connie and others that uh, have been mentioned. Uh, pray that um, through this time that all will, will look to you. Father, as we go to our homes now, we pray that you keep us safe. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.